Yeah, thank you, Maxi. Um, and um, yeah, I'm very happy to, uh, to be in this conference. So this is a, a part of a joint project with uh, Matthew Adler from Duke, uh, Richard Bradley, Alex Voru from the LSE, and Madalena Ferrana and James Hamid from uh, the Harvard School of Public Health. Um, so the um, question is essentially whether we should have a tight or a lax uh, COVID uh, suppression policy um, in terms of social welfare. And um, there is in particular the, uh, some, some very basic cost-benefit analysis that can be done with value of statistical life. And uh, there is a presumption that uh, since the value of statistical life is uh, usually a huge number, it might inflate uh, the value of the life saved, especially because this particular pandemic is, uh, is, uh, is touching uh, people who are uh, quite uh, late in their life. And so the number of uh, years lost is not that big compared to a pandemic that would be more evenly spread over uh, age groups. So there seems to be a clash of uh, generations or age groups. The young will suffer a lot from the economic cost of restrictions, uh, whereas the elderly tend to benefit more from the health uh, measures. But one should not forget social inequalities. Uh, the poor uh, suffer uh, disproportionately from the economic impacts as well as from the mortality uh, and disease impacts. And so the, the project here is to try to do social welfare analysis and see how uh, the conclusions depend on the degree of priority that we might put on the worst of, right? So in terms of uh, ethical uh, perspective, uh, how does it matter to put priority on the worst of? Um, and so in order to do that, we need to, uh, to work with numbers uh, to have a more or less realistic um, rough ideas of, uh, of the orders of magnitude of the, of the policy impact. Um, and so we are looking at a model where we uh, have put the US uh, population described by age group and income quintile. Um, we use a basic uh, SIR uh, pandemic model with uh, only one group in terms of transition, trans transmission and mechanism. Uh, there are no um, very no sophisticated description of contacts by subgroups. Um, we have uh, calibrated the pandemic uh, in terms of the characteristics of the beginning of the pandemic. So we'll be essentially re-simulating the year 2020 and 2021. Um, and so you know that the Delta variant has an R0 that is uh, about twice as much uh, as the initial um, uh, virus, but, um, but we'll, we'll, we'll do that. And um, we measure uh, well-being uh, for people in terms of lifetime well-being, not just their yearly well-being, but their lifetime, uh, because this is an event that really, if you die from this disease, it really cuts your life short. And that is something that can be appreciated really only if we look at lifetime well-being. Um, and so we are uh, led to measure that. And we do it in a way that is easy to compare across people and to compare with monetary measures by computing the constant equivalent income. That's the income level that if it were constant uh, until age 100 and no risk of mortality, we give the same well-being to a person as the current situation that this person had with, with fluctuating income and with potentially a shorter life. And we uh, look at social welfare measured in three uh, potential ways. So one is this uh, lifetime well being measured. And then when we evaluate the distribution, we compute something that's again a, a monetary measure, uh, which is the equally distributed equivalent. So that's the level of this uh, measure uh, at the individual level that if it were given to everybody equally, would give you a social distribution that is as good as the, the unequal distribution that we observe, right? So that's a, an easy way uh, to, uh, to understand. So essentially this measure tells you, if I summarize everything, uh, it tells you if everybody was living a hundred years with a constant income uh, throughout their life uh, and there was no inequality, what would this level of income be if uh, social welfare was the same as in the current situation, where all sorts of inequalities in mortality, income, and fluctuations over that happened. Right? Um, the other measures uh, are more traditional cost benefit measures. So, adding up the VSL value of statistical life of total fatalities and counting total income loss on top of that. And the other one is adding up the value of statistical life year. Uh, uh, so, the and that can be applied to the years lost. So it takes account of the differential longevity of people who die 
at different ages. And again, you add up the hypoprotein from loss. Um, a few assumptions, I'll go quick on that perhaps. So we assume, we, because we look at lifetime well-being, we have to assume what the future will look like in terms of potential growth. So we can assume there is growth rate. What I show is about 200% assumption of growth that we can do less or more than that. Um, we use historical growth for uh, past income because we have to go back in, in, in the past in order to assess the lifetime of being, especially for the elderly people. Um, and, um, and we use the uh, typical lifetime income profile that people have in order to project that uh, because different age groups uh, start at different ages uh, in 2020. And so we have to look at the, the potential evolution of their careers and the income that goes with them. Um, then we have, unfortunately, we have no data on the distribution of mortality by social group, by quintile, and uh, also the distribution of the cost of lockdown policies. And so we make assumptions there and we test what happens when we change these assumptions. So the central assumption assumes that it's roughly unfair uh, in the sense that the mortality is concentrated on the poor and the uh, distribution of cost is less than proportional to income. So the poor suffer a greater share, uh, lose a greater share of their income than the rich. Okay. We also assume that the people uh, above uh, 65 are not affected by the lockdown uh, economically. Essentially, we assume they are pensioners and their pensions are not affected, which is a, a simplifying assumption that, uh, that somehow makes the potential clash between generations uh, starker in this analysis. Um, the contagion model is uh, actually not exactly SIR. It's a nonlinear model, which allows us to really take account of the number of contacts that people have. Um, and so it's a slightly not, it's, it's not a big deal. It's a very close to an SIR model. Um, the difference is mostly when you have a high peak of contamination, uh, this nonlinear model is slightly less, uh, uh, less terrible in terms of the number of contamination. So it curves a little bit uh, the contamination. Um, we assume that we have 50% people who are, who are symptomatic and are tested and isolated early uh, with a test effectiveness of 70%. So that might be, we might revise this because uh, there are some recent studies showing that symptomatic people are more in the 70% than in the 50%, but, um, but that's what I'll be showing today. Uh, and we also assume that uh, there is, uh, even if there is no lockdown, we see people do reduce their contacts spontaneously when they see mortality ri rising. Uh, okay, so there is some endogeneity of behaviors. So the, the policy instruments we uh, examine in this analysis are three, uh, three numbers. One is the uh, percentage of reduction of contacts through uh, the lockdown policy. Okay, and we look at numbers from 50% to 90% reduction of contact. And then uh, we assume that the lockdown policy is automatic in the sense that it is triggered when the uh, incentive care unit occupancy uh, passes a threshold, passes above a threshold, and is stopped only when this occupancy rate falls below another threshold, which is lower than the first threshold. Right? So for instance, you might start a lockdown when you reach 50% of occupancy, and you stop the lockdown when you come back below 20%, something like that. That's the typical example we, we put on. Okay, so in our, in our, in our uh, numbers in our sample that we construct with the data. So uh, a lot of assumptions have to be made because there is no statistic that gives us exactly what we want, that is decomposition by age group and quintiles and income quintiles, but, but we make assumptions and we, we get something that might be more or less representative. Um, and so we can describe inequalities in a typical uh, situation with the crisis. Uh, what, so this is um, a Lorentz curve that describes inequalities, but where we identify the groups that appear in this uh, curve, and we have people here are differentiated by three uh, characteristics. Their age group, so their age in 2020, their income quintile, and their age at death, right? And so we, we simulate mortality also with non-COVID causes uh, after the, the pandemic. I should have said also that we simulate the pandemic over two years only, and we assume that after two years, uh, some uh, treatment or some vaccination ends the pandemic somewhat magically, so we don't describe the introduction of vaccines uh, carefully in this, uh, this simulation. And so what we see here is that uh, we have the groups, the colors represent the groups of different cohorts, different age groups, 
And we see that we have, among the worse off in the population, we do have some uh, young people, and that will be, as you'll see, mostly the young people who have a short life, who, who die early, but we also have some elderly people. And why that? Well, because elderly people had a low consumption in the past, right? so they had the advantage of having uh, lived long, but their consumption, some of them have gone through the uh, crisis of the 30s, uh, so the big uh, uh, depression and all that. So, so this shows in these, uh, these inequalities. When you look at income quintiles, uh, it's less um, complex. Uh, the, so the, the rich quintile are uh, darker in colors here. Uh, and of course, you find them among the advantage of the population. Although you do have some overlap in the middle because of the inequalities in longevity that people have and that uh, uh, make uh, introduce some, uh, some additional variation across people. Um, you can also look at uh, things in terms of eight of year of, uh, of death. Um, and that, uh, not surprisingly, shows that the people will live very long. Uh, so the young people now will live very long and enjoy future growth, future economic growth, are among the better off. Um, in the, so the, the worse off are mostly among the people who die in the first years of, uh, of this, uh, this simulation. OK, so some results about these policy instruments that we have. Um, if so, this type of graph has on the horizontal axis the severity of the lockdown from 50% to 90%. And I'm showing what happens in terms of outcomes on vertical axis. So here we have the total death count over two years. Um, we have uh, something that, uh, so the counts represent different levels of the ICU threshold. Okay, so the, the upper one here corresponds to uh, high levels of thresholds or rather lax policy. Uh, and if you have a strict policy, you have lower thresholds, so you stop, uh, you stop the lockdown uh, quickly, and you stop only when you fall below, for instance, 20 percent here with the, uh, with the blue curve. And so this graph shows quite clearly that in, on, in terms of uh, total impact on fatalities, it's better to have a strict, uh, a strict uh, level of lockdown with a strict uh, threshold, like with low threshold. So all, all these things go in the same direction. We don't really examine the policy of zero COVID here. Um, and uh, so this is not exactly about zero COVID. So we are looking at things which are less extreme than zero COVID, but nevertheless goes clearly in that direction. So just to illustrate a little bit what these policies mean. So the, the blue curve here represents the wave of the pandemic when we have a rather lax policy with high thresholds and 70% um, lockdown. So between 50% and 70%, actually, it's, uh, it's very lax in terms of reduction of contacts. So we have three waves, and I believe uh, that uh, probably there is no further wave. So uh, herd immunity has been built up. Right? Whereas if we have a strict policy, then we have more waves, and uh, probably uh, we'll stop here, but there might be other waves if there was no vaccination and no treatment. The consequences on mortality are, are rather stark indeed. Um, so that's, um, that's what we get in this, uh, with this simulation. So in terms of economic impact, we have something that's uh, not surprising um, and has been found elsewhere. So it's a thumb shape. So the, the cost, so this is the loss of income over two years, measured in percentage of a yearly GDP. Um, and so uh, it's a thumb shape in the sense that an intermediate policy is the worst. Uh, it's better to either have very uh, little lockdown or having very strict lockdown. Uh, that, that is uh, good as well. And so this is uh, quite typical, but middle, middle of the range policies are not particularly good. Now, let's talk about social welfare, since this is the topic of this, uh, of this talk. Um, so this is what you see in terms of outcomes. So the, again, what you have on the vertical axis is this uh, equally distributed equivalent of the uh, equivalent income. So low numbers, because I've put a high inequality aversion. So we are really focusing on the worse of in the population. Um, and what we get is pretty clear. Uh, it's always better in terms of social welfare to have a stricter uh, lockdown with a stricter uh, threshold. Right? So that's a, that's a clear message. And this is pretty robust, doesn't depend very much on the inequality aversion. Um, so here you have the graph that on, so on the left hand side, the graph that you would have zero inequality aversion, very similar shape of the curve. If we went to extreme inequality aversions here, 100, or here we just focus on the very, very worst of, 
uh, then we start to see something that's different. And here, the very, very worst of in this evaluation, who are they? They are the young people who die in 2020, right? And so these are very, very few people, but we have some of them. And the lockdown policies are no good for them uh, because they don't benefit from these prevention measures. Uh, they die anyway. So if we are really focused on the worst of, it's only the economic aspect of the policy that matters because the health policies, they can't benefit from them. Um, of course, this is really extreme. Um, and what we observe here, these curves correspond actually to the cost in the first year. So these people, if they die in 2020, what happens in 2021 doesn't matter to them. Um, and we see that for them, uh, if we have a lax uh, policy in terms of uh, uh, lockdown, uh, it's better to have a lax policy also in terms of uh, threshold, because then you have less uh, economic impact. The things are, uh, because of the hand-shaped uh, thing, things are a bit different when we have strict, strict uh, lockdown policy. Okay, um, now if we were to do a rough uh, VSL uh, cost-benefit analysis, right, with the value of statistical life, uh, what, we would, what we would get is actually very similar to what we have with this social welfare thing. So the curve look extremely similar. Um, and so in a way it vindicates so the numbers here are negative because the measure is uh, the loss that we have in terms of uh, uh, lives lost uh, evaluated by VSL and GDP loss, right? And so it's not negative numbers and it's better to be higher in order to have less of a loss. Um, and so, but really the results are, are very much the same. When we use the VSL Y, it's actually a little bit different. And here what happens is that because the numbers of uh, years lost are not that big because the average patient loses perhaps 10 to 12 years of life. Um, that's an average number, of course. So it's not as uh, impressive in terms of health impact than for the VSL. Um, then uh, the economic impact uh, looms larger in the evaluation. Right? And so it is quite interesting that the social welfare evaluation that actually takes account of the, the actual longevity impact on people's situation in terms of lifetime well-being, gives you something that's closer to the VSL evaluation and to the VSLY evaluation, right? So, uh, so somehow it shows that the real uh, evaluation of well-being is uh, putting a greater weight on the health impact than you would do if you were just doing this uh, uh, basic accounting in terms of value of statistical life here. Um, and then we can um, look a little bit at, at who gains and who loses from various policies. So here I'm comparing a strict policy, uh, which is the, the uh, uh, quite strict where 90% uh, lockdown rate and uh, the thresholds are 30% and 10%. And the lax policy is this uh, middle of the road um, uh, lockdown policy 70% and the uh, middle of the road um, thresholds 50% uh, and 50%. Um, so then what we see is that in terms of, uh, uh, oh yeah, so I should explain what these graphs are. So we are now grouping people by income quintile and uh, the cohorts, their age group in 2020. And so we compute the average gain for all these people um, aggregating over the people who have different longevities, right? And so it's a sort of ex ante perspective. In 2020, how do things look for these groups, um, taking account of the mortality changes uh, for these groups that differ depending on their situation? Okay, and so what we see is that the gains, the absolute gains are concentrated among the elderly and the rich among them. When we look in terms of relative gains, uh, it's a bit, more widespread, but still, this is the um, this is the message. So, um, when we look at the details, actually, every group in these graphs uh, gains a little bit, um, but but the concentration of the gains is is pretty key. Right? Um, now, if we uh, look at a change of policy that goes from very lax to middle of the road in terms of uh, just the uh, lockdown uh, rate, so from fifty percent. 70%, keeping the thresholds at a middle uh, level, then we do see that uh, the people who lose from this uh, policy are the young and the poor, I mean the poor young, more or less, um, 
And this is because they really are very sensible to the economic cost. And, um, and, and the economic cost is, uh, is, is, as we've seen, because of the handshake, is, uh, is um, uh, much uh, higher when we move from very lax policy to uh, middle of the road uh, lockdown policy. Right? Um, so that, that's a case in which uh, we do see a sort of clash between, between generations. But when we uh, compare a middle of the road uh, lockdown policy to a strict lockdown policy, then we lose that. There is no clash anymore. Every group gains um, and the uh, relative variations are uh, like that. And we see that actually uh, the poor people tend to gain a little more if we look at the younger generations than the rich people uh, here, uh, showing that uh, yeah, uh, the health impacts uh, loom large for, uh, for these people. And of course, the economic impacts, which are also good when we move uh, from, from this uh, middle of the road policy to a stricter policy are also good. So everything goes in the right direction for, uh, for these people. Um, maybe uh, in the interest of time, I'll, uh, I'll skip the discussion of what happens for other assumptions about the distribution of cost, uh, of economic cost and of mortality across social groups. Um, but, but this can be uh, tested with the, with the model. Um, the thing that um, I uh, could mention is that, uh, maybe, and I, I will uh, finish on that, is that there is an apparent complementarity between policies. And so here we are looking at a situation in which the uh, distribution of cost is very unfair. So the poor suffer a lot from the economic impact, uh, but health is actually uh, fairly, the health impacts are so-called fairly distributed in the sense that they are independent of people's uh, income. Right? Um, and uh, in that case, we see that when we uh, look at uh, something with uh, an evaluation of social welfare with high inequality aversion, then here we have an interesting reversal of the threshold evaluation. So when we are with the lax lockdown policies, uh, we should have a, a high uh, threshold, so a lax policy in terms of threshold. But when we have a strict uh, lockdown policy, we should also have a strict policy in terms of threshold. Okay, so this sort of complementarity, we already saw it a little bit when we are looking at the very worst of in the initial uh, scenarios. Uh, so this is something that is um, interesting to see. And for instance, uh, we can add one more dimension of policy here, and I'll conclude with that, which is the presence of tests. So if we test, uh, the, what I've shown so far was assuming that we were testing the symptomatic people with some effectiveness. If we did not test them, the situation would be worse, and we see that the results are, uh, are substantially worse in terms of uh, both uh, death and uh, economic cost. So the test policy really helps, enhances the power of the lockdown and, uh, and the, threshold, uh, uh, the threshold number. So it's, these policies are, are really complementary. Um, and we can even find some complementarity in terms of uh, a, an increasing gap between the gain that we have moving from lax thresholds to strict thresholds uh, when we have a strict uh, lockdown and when we have tests. So this, so somehow all the policies combine together. Uh, so the, the bottom line is if you want to be, to be ambitious with your policy, you better be ambitious on all fronts. Um, so strict lockdowns, a lot of tests and everything. So let me stop here to leave time for Q&As and many thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you. This has been really interesting. I'll uh, give a round of digital applause and also real applause to you. Thank you very much. Um, I would now like to open the floor to questions, as you suggested. So if you want to raise your hand, please, and then I'll happily uh, allow you to ask a question. Um, hello, I thank you for for the talk. I just I just wanted to to ask you. I, perhaps you've talked about it. I, I'm not sure uh, about mental health. Um, I, I was wondering because of course there's a trade off between health and and economic aspects. But uh, one one thing that we witnessed uh, very soon was it it was also a, a, a very hard decision to 
to uh, have a lockdown because of health, uh, mental health issues. And I just wanted to know if you had taken these aspects into account or uh, if you knew uh, studies that did. Thank you. Right. Um, no, and we haven't looked at that. And indeed, uh, we, we have been thinking all along that it would be nice to introduce it. That would be the next step. Um, and I'm not sure that a similar analysis has been done in terms of uh, comprehensive social welfare evaluation uh, that takes account of that as well. Um, so, so that, uh, of course, that would require um, some um, uh, calibration, some, some estimation of what, what it means in terms of uh, lifetime well being. Uh, so, that's pretty tricky to do. And one other thing that we are not looking at, which is a bit related, is that we are looking only at adult populations. We are not looking at the long term impacts on, uh, on, on the young students, for instance. Right? So, the fact that uh, schools have been disrupted may have very long-term impacts in terms of human capital and people, uh, people's development. Um, and, and that is ignored as well. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, you had your hand up. Yeah, there you are. I was, I was wondering how much the, the state policies are informed by uh, such uh, economic evaluations. We've seen very different policies. I'm thinking, for example, of uh, Sweden, or uh, the Netherlands, and then, uh, and do you have an insight on how they they, they actually uh, grounded their decisions? No, I have no. Uh, I'm afraid I have no insight at all about that. Um, I guess uh, I mean we should probably look at the recommendations of the councils that uh, exist in, in different countries. Uh, even though we've seen that their recommendations are not always followed. Uh, so sometimes the politicians bet on uh, um, a mistake or some uh, pessimistic uh, prediction made by council. Um, so yeah, so there is a strong political dimension, of course, right? Uh, the, the, uh, there is what's bearable by populations and what seems unbearable. So that's uh, something that we don't consider at all here, this model. We assume that there is total freedom of, of deciding what thresholds are and when to start a lockdown, when to stop it. Uh, the, the political, psychological, a component looms large probably in uh, actual decisions and is completely absent from this type of analysis. Um, but I suppose that uh, uh, the, I mean, early on, uh, various papers in the, in the newspapers have argued that the rough uh, cost benefit analysis was very much in favor of uh, strong, ambitious health policies. And uh, a lot of um, voices have been raised for the zero COVID approach and all that. So I guess this had some influence uh, because if you compare what we've done in this pandemic with what has been done or rather what has not been done in the pandemic of 57, uh, 1957. So there is a change in culture. We seem to uh, put more, much more weight on uh, the value of life uh, and health. Um, so that's uh, quite interesting, but yeah, I don't have any insider view of how these decisions are really made. Thank you very much. Yeah, on that note, Mark, I'd, I'd also like to ask a question if you if you allow me, if you still have a minute. Mm -hmm. um, basically, we see this this age curve, right? And the really young ones who die young, but also sort of the the really old ones seem to be the most affected at the end of the day. And so then I, I very much like your edit. You want to be ambitious, better be ambitious on all fronts. But what we've seen is basically from all your data, and I think this is very nice and very visible, we'd better be strict on ourselves than we have the smaller course, we have all of these things. Yet from, and this is anecdotal, but I think we've heard this from a lot of people, usually the very young ones, they are the ones who say, it's my life, you're curtailing me right now, and I'd, I'd like to go out, and I'm also not going to die from this, I'm young and strong. And on the other curve, we also see the people, well, I don't want to live like this, I'm isolated, I don't have anyone, I'd rather have, you know, half a year, that's all right, than two years in prison. So these seem to be the ones that stand to benefit the most from that, yet they, they are the ones that have the highest resistance. And so um, how, how do you think we could communicate this and feed this forward? This is- Yeah, so but part of what you say has to do with things that we didn't introduce, right? So we didn't take into account. And especially for instance, the, the reduction in contacts uh, has a psychological effect. So Simon was mentioning mental health, but even without mental health problems, people may, just genuinely dislike having this reduction in contact. Um, and so that's an additional effect that would be uh, worth introducing indeed. Um, so in, in a way, um, 
you can do it in a very a quick and dirty way in our model by saying it's as if the economic cost was larger. Right? So uh, that, that's a way of doing it in, without, uh, without a serious calibration. Um, but, um, but yeah, uh, I, I agree. Now, on the, for the young people who say, this is my life, I want to go out. Yes, but you do have some young people who suffer from the disease. And for them, the, it's really a catastrophic shock on their life. Uh, even long COVID when, when it starts very young. So, um, so the very worst off are the young people indeed, but not the young people who are, who are locked down, the young people who die in spite of the measures, right? These are the real worst off people and we should never forget them. Um, so of course they are small in numbers, uh, but, but it's really a catastrophe for these people. So how important should, should how, how, how much priority should we put on these very worst off people? That's an ethical issue, of course. Yeah, thank you very much. I think this is one that will carry forward as well, maybe to a discussion tonight in the panel.